COVID happens, you have to shift and you have to listen to what your clients are saying and what they want. So what's really unique about our business is it, it's service, right? You're, you're not selling a sneaker. You're not selling Kleenex. You're, you're selling a service. So it's really niche, I would say. And we really had to listen to the customers and say, okay, a lot of these people, their teams, right? There were layoffs. The teams had shrunk. The priorities for our customers had shifted. A lot of people weren't looking to spend outrageous amounts of money, right? Their budgets were cut. So we listened to them. We heard what they were saying, what was important to them. And we started hosting a number of virtual events, virtual roundtables. And by this, our topics would be based on, you know, doing more with less, right? <laughs> what what to do, right? When your team is slashed, your budget is slashed and really providing that safe space for people. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples, not just trending ideas or buzzword laden schmaltz, real world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. How I Made It in Marketing is not about marketing. I mean, not really. It's about marketers. And the funny thing about marketers is that we're not just marketers. We're also human beings. So to succeed as marketers, we also have to be successful humans. Sounds funny, right? But I mean, come on, you know it in your heart's true. It's not just technology and databases and leads. So that's why I love this lesson from a recent podcast guest application, Balance Ambition with Wellbeing. Here to share how she learned that lesson, along with many more lessons and stories from throughout her career, is Jordan Welby, the Director of Marketing Ops at Sella by Randstad Digital. Thanks for joining us, Jordan. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Let's take a quick look at your background so people know who I'm talking to. Uh, you started very early in your career interning as an HR coordinator for Pfizer. Uh, and you moved on to being a sales coordinator for National Cinemedia. You've been a marketing project coordinator at Boucher Design and Communications. And for the past seven years, you've been at Sella, where Jordan is now director of marketing operations. Sella is owned by Randstad. Randstad is a publicly traded company that generated 25.4 billion euros in revenue in 2003. And Jordan oversees operations for a team of 11 and has two direct reports herself. So Jordan, give us a sense. What is your day like as VP of marketing operations? Yes. So actually director of marketing operations. I don't want to take oh, my... Oh, sorry. Director. I just <laughs> gave you a promotion. There you go. I know. My uh, boss is going to be surprised, but... <laughs> um, Yes. Yeah, so what is my day like? So, uh, you know, to get very granular, I have two small children. So I start my day getting them ready. So, you know, very calm, as parents will tell you, very soothing, uh, almost like meditation. So <laughs> I start my day getting them ready getting them off to their schools, their daycares, right? And then I uh, have the privilege of being able to work remotely, which is amazing for my work-life balance. Um, so I gear up and I get ready for my day here working at Sella. Um, I really like to start my day, I would say, kind of aligning myself to the tasks I know I have to accomplish, um, any follow-up I know I have to really secure for the day, um, any people I need to speak to. I like to set goals for that. So the whole day doesn't get ahead of you as sometimes it may. Um, so I do that. Then after I kind of set those tasks and goals, I really like to do any follow up with people I have to speak to figure out if projects that we're working on are aligned. Are there any roadblocks? You know, if there are, how we're going to solve those problems. And it's almost like the beginning of my day is a one big task list, I would say, and I'm checking off a lot of tasks. Um, then probably go into my meeting chunk of the day. <laughs> I've learned, uh, you know, after all these years, unfortunately we do have a lot of meetings. Um, but you know, a lot of them are to really discuss strategy and goals, which I enjoy. Um, I really enjoy the people I work with. So the meetings are not terrible. I would say almost they're a labor of love. So <laughs> I have a lot of meetings to go over that. Um, and then I also do a lot of looking over analytics, I would say checking in on our marketing dashboards, seeing how our current campaigns are performing, you know, basically taking all that information and crafting it into 
what's next, what are we doing now, you know, all of that. Um, and then probably a break somewhere in there, I would say. Uh, and then, you know, towards the end of the day, I really like to make sure that if there's any ASAP things happening, anything I really need to accomplish by end of day, again, I touch base on those, follow up and make sure those are accomplished. I've learned over the years that you're never going to be done every day. It's impossible, but you do have to know when to turn it off, set the computer down and move forward. Otherwise you'll, you'll just drive yourself crazy. So you have to have that good balance for sure. I love hearing you talk and I love having an operations person on because, you know, we have a lot of creative marketers and technical marketers and different type of people, but you've, you've, you're talking a very rigorous and orderly fashion <laughs> where I would expect an operations person to. I think we're going to learn a lot from you in that respect, I, but I didn't hear the word Gantt chart. Are there any Gantt charts that you glance at at any point in the day? Or <laughs> You know, sometimes they're on the computer. I okay. don't know if I'm purposefully uh, leaving them out, ignoring them, <laughs> uh, uh, blocking it out. But uh, definitely, you know, they're there here and there for sure. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at some lessons you've learned from your career. Uh, the first one you mentioned is inconsistent branding dilutes the message. So how did you learn this lesson and, and how did you live it? Absolutely. So I had the privilege of being part of a major rebrand with Sella in 2020. So it was actually a project that started, I would say, in 2019. Um, and at the time, Sella was, the former company was BLR Holdings. And that pairing company um, had a number of brands under it, three distinct brands. And uh, you know, they found over the years that diluting the brand with these different messages, different creative, right? These audiences, you know, maybe there was a way to consolidate um, and really make the brand succeed and be more powerful being united under one. Um, so I was really heavily involved in the rebrand with the team at the time. It was smaller. Um, so I wore a lot of different hats. Um, I was heavily involved in all the social media, the email marketing, website support, um, our public relations and corporate communications at the time. Um, many of the assets during our brand launch, I consider those something I made. <laughs> I'm doing air quotes, but I, uh, you know, would write the copy. I would make sure that everything was launched, make sure our audiences were targeted. And, you know, from this, I learned that really maintaining that consistent brand, that voice, that visual identity, you know, it's essential to really strengthen and propel your brand, regardless of industry. Um, you really need to have that consistency, I would say. And um, one of the craziest factors of all of this was we launched our rebrand in February of 2020. So we went into this thinking, you know, 2020 would be the year of Sela. And a month later, the world shut down. So that was a really interesting time to launch a rebrand. Um, a lot of shifting priorities, right? A lot of um, clients and talents we're dealing with in the marketplace were having their own struggles, I would say. And, you know, Sella was really there to support both our clients, both our talent. Um, and our rebrand at that point was ever so important because I imagine if we didn't have that United brand, it would have been even more difficult to really survive that whole year and plus of COVID. Yeah. So you mentioned it's kind of three brands coming together as Sella. Then you were acquired by Randstad. And we're going to get into some of the operational aspects of an acquisition, which I think we can learn a lot from you with that. But we're, since we're talking about branding, I want to ask, like, can you take us through considerations that the team makes in like leveraging or choosing not to leverage the parent company's heritage now that you're like a standalone brand within a subsidiary? So for example, uh, I wrote an article on branding. I wrote about the rebranding of Stuckey's. So I don't know how, if everyone knows Stuckey's, Stuckey's is here in the South. It's one of those kind of roadside stands. Uh, it's been around since 1937. So they were looking to update the brand, but at the same time, they wanted to tap into that heritage that Stuckey's had. And they had a company history section on their website and FAQ. And the CEO, the CEO, sorry, CEO, CEO told me that the data told them that their audience wanted more heritage content, right? They listen to their audience are like, hey, that heritage stuff is important. So when you talk about the rebrand for Cello, okay, that was before the standalone company. Now there's the acquisition. Now there's Randstad, which is, this, as we talk about, giant brand in the industry. So how did then 
Randstad, that heritage, that brand get involved with the seller brand? How did you leverage that? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. I mean, when you have a powerhouse like Ronstad behind you, um, it's it's amazing, right? I think it's opened so many doors for Sella. It's enabled us to go into the global marketplace, you know, which we we weren't able to do previously. There are just so many positives there. And I think what Sella's advantage was in this aspect was the Sella brand really had hold of the digital marketing and creative marketplace. So we were known for digital marketing and creative specifically with our talent, with our clients, right? And I think that was something really important to Ronstad because they have so many service lines, right? So many operations there. And they really wanted to make a splash in those specific areas. So acquiring Sella someone that already has that name recognition, right? Already has that customer and brand loyalty um, was really beneficial, I think. And as we've learned over these years, we were acquired in 2021. um, We've been able to incorporate elements of Ronset Digital and maybe not necessarily their creative aspects, but we've been able to incorporate um, their service excellence, right? How they service their customers, all of their operations, right? Their speed to market, again, their global capabilities. So I almost find it more that we've been able to incorporate their longevity, their history, and their service excellence into our Sella brand to say, hey, Sella is here. We're the same as we've always been. You're excellent providers for this niche market. But now we have this global powerhouse behind us. So everything you were getting before, you can get it now, better, faster, speed, quality, price, all of that. So I found that that's been more of the um, coming together and the integration over these past few years. Well, let's talk about that integration because like we said, Stella was inquired by Brandstat. Most people listening to this call, if you have a career in marketing, you're going to be part of an acquisition at some point on either mm-hmm. side, either the acquiring company or the acquired company. So you, this was your big lesson. You said successful mergers require integration and alignment around strategy goals and team structure. So take us through that. How how did that happen? Absolutely. So during this period of time, I think I was in a really unique position where we had a VP of marketing. Our team was pretty small still at the time. We hadn't grown yet. So I got to experience a lot of firsthand experiences with this integration and the whole acquisition that I don't think many people in my role normally get to experience. So I consider myself really lucky with that. Along with that came a lot, though, you know, to be very honest, there, there were a lot of stressful moments, a lot of work to be done because you're not only integrating your systems, your technology, but you're also integrating how you operate as a whole, right? Your culture. Um, and that's this one thing that's really important to Sella is our culture, our identity. Um, and during that time, you know, I really tried to ensure that the marketing team was not only operating efficiently, but they were also thriving during this time of ever-changing priorities. Because on a small scale, Sella would have right certain revenue goals or things they wanted to accomplish for the quarter. But now you're you're talking Ronstadt, so you're talking much larger goals sometimes, much larger initiatives. And I really wanted to make sure the operations of the team stayed true to ourselves, that everyone was being able to really succeed, not getting overwhelmed by the change. And that was really important to me. And I learned really that like the integration and alignment to ensure like marketing functions were continuing to strive. Um that was that was my goal the whole time, you know, helping kind of create this strong and more unified organization and not any sort of difference between the two. All right. So now here we are. We've got the benefit of hindsight, right? This this already <laughs> happened a few years ago. What advice would you give? Like, can you give us a specific of something you would have changed differently when you were approaching it if you knew that at the time? Right. So, you know, for example, when we talk about a merger, right? There's integrations of tech systems. There's, uh, you know, making sure the branding is aligned. There's, you know, all of these different elements. And I would think in the beginning, you've got to sit down 
and operationalize this and project plan this. And I joke around about Gantt charts, but I mean, you've, you've got to like map this out and say, okay, within three months or six months or one quarter or five quarters, you know, the, the technology is going to be integrated. We're all using the same email or calendar system or CRM or whatever it is. And so the problem I always have with project planning is I'm just trying to guess or educated guesswork. Sometimes you've done it 10 times before and, and you know it well, like a marketing campaign, but Sometimes you've been bought by, you know, a $20 billion plus company. <laughs> and for the first time ever, you've got to kind of get absorbed and integrated into that. And you've never done this before. And you've got a project plan. So now that you have the benefit of hindsight, what would you go back and give us like a specific of something you would go back and do a little differently, or maybe something where you're like, man, I knocked it out of the park. I would do that the exact same way. And it worked so well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good question. I think it's hard, right? Because at the time you don't know what you don't know. Um, and for me, it was the first time going through this whole experience. I had a lot of people around me, right, that were very seasoned, um, a lot of people to help, a lot of people to guide. Um, but definitely for the marketing team, I think one of the things that we could have not done better, but maybe, you know, tapped into more was really utilizing the people and the expertise on the Ronstead side to get the word out more, if that makes sense. So I think there could have been more opportunities to maybe make a bigger splash with our announcements and how we made those announcements. You know, at the time, we just kind of proceeded with a little bit of caution, I would say. Um, because again, when you're speaking now for this global brand, to be very honest, you don't want to say the wrong thing. You want to make sure that everything is aligned, right? You're saying everything you should be saying. Um, and it was a lot of, it was a new experience to a lot of people on the team. So I would say doing more, I think that's what we could have done. We could, we did a little, I think we could have done more to more of an, more announcing, more promotion, whether that be through our paid advertising, right? Our social lines, our influencer marketing, uh, any of those channels, um, I think we could do more. I think we were um, we were just cautious at the time. And now looking back, I'm like, oh, I wish we did a bigger splash, but it all worked out. <laughs> nice. Well, like I said, when you're playing that, you you, you mentioned great, you don't know what you don't know. And that's, that's true for our marketing campaigns too, right? Uh, and so sometimes we just go by our gut, what we think will work. You yeah. say launch campaigns based on data, not personal preferences and assumptions. So how did you learn this? Yeah. So I feel like I've learned this maybe the hard way over time. Um, I've worked for really small organizations. I've worked for large organizations. And I feel sometimes in the past, you know, at smaller organizations, you're almost making a lot of anecdotal decisions. And sometimes that's because you don't have the technology to back up your decision making, right? Sometimes you have you know, legacy employees who say, this is the way it's been done every year. This is the way we're going to do it. Um, and early on in your career, you're you're surviving a lot of times, right? You're like, yes, yes, person, that sounds great. Let's do it. Um, and I think learning that and looking back, I always think now, you know, let's make our decisions off of the data. Um, you know, for example, we we host a lot of events, we produce a lot of content, and I don't want to do things just because we should do things. That's never how I want a team to run. I want to make sure that we're producing something because there's a need for it in the marketplace. Our audience is saying they want it, right? Let's look at our data. How is our email performing, right? Should we be targeting these specific people still? How is our social media performing? Should we be um, looking into posting more, posting less, you know, doing more video, whatever that is, I think the data really has to drive your decisions because the truth is in the numbers, right? That's not going to lie. And if you have the technology and you have the experts to support that data, I think it's only going to be beneficial for what you produce. Can you give us a specific example of something you learned about the customer from the data and then how you put that into action? For example, uh, when I wrote about data-driven marketing, uh, I had an interesting story about tent craft, which sold tents for events and concerts, right? But during COVID, <laughs> all of a sudden, there's no events and concerts. And they looked at the data and they pivoted to selling tents to hospitals and healthcare systems for drive-through COVID testing, right? So they looked at that data, they saw that opportunity, they acted on it. And the president told me, a big takeaway for our team is that we need to always be pivoting to new markets, new products, features, and partners 
and you find that in the data. So can you think of any specific example of something that you saw in the data, your team saw in the data that you learned about the customer and that then how you acted on that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, kind of similar, I would say during before COVID, our company, we hosted a lot of in-person events. So whether that was attending shows as sponsors, as partners, and then we host a number of events ourselves. So whether that be roundtables, professional development, right? COVID happens, you have to shift and you have to listen to what your clients are saying and what they want. So what's really unique about our business is it, it's service, right? You're, you're not selling a sneaker. You're not selling Kleenex. You're, you're selling a service. So it's really niche, I would say. And we really had to listen to the customers and say, okay, a lot of these people, their teams, right? There were layoffs. The teams had shrunk. The priorities for our customers had shifted. A lot of people weren't looking to spend outrageous amounts of money, right? Their budgets were cut. So we listened to them. We heard what they were saying, what was important to them. And we started hosting a number of virtual events, virtual roundtables. And by this, our topics would be based on, you know, doing more with less, right? Uh, what what to do, right? When your team is slashed, your budget is slashed. And really providing that safe space for people to communicate and talk about, you know, their pain points and how we can be there to listen, to help. Um, and I really do think it shifted from prior to that, you know, and there's always ebbs and flows in the market, right? So there's always years where people are, you know, full of cash and years when they're not. So I think that that is always, you know, a factor, but definitely during that point, we listened to our audience. We found out, okay, their concerns have shifted. How, how does someone go from a team of a hundred to a team of two and still produce their marketing campaigns, right? And then we had these events and hosted them virtually and were able to really connect with our audience still. That's great. Um, we talked about some lessons about the things you made. In just a moment, we're going to talk about some of the lessons about people you made them with, because that's what we get to do as marketers. We get to build things and we get to make them with people. Uh, but first, I should mention that the How I Made It in Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs AI, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. Right now, you can get a three-month full scholarship for free to the AI Guild at join.mechlabsai.com to help you prepare for the artificial intelligence marketing revolution. That's join.meclabsai.com to learn so much about artificial intelligence and apply it to your marketing career. All right, so let's, like I said, let's talk about some lessons you learned from now from the people you got to collaborate with. We don't just make things. It's a great part of marketing. We get to make them with people. So you say balance ambition with well-being. That's something I mentioned in the open. You said you learned this from Carissa Sachs. How did you learn this from Carissa? Yeah, absolutely. So I've always been um, a self-proclaimed hard worker. <laughs> Hopefully other people around me would say that as well. Um, but, you know, sometimes to to a fault, I would say. Um, and you go through different stages in life, right? And sometimes before I had my two children, I was able to work, you know, that for as long as I needed to, you know, nights, weekends, not that there was pressure to, but almost putting that pressure on myself. And I think you really have to learn how to balance that once you have a family in my experience, because um, it's just a totally different ball game. And I recently had my second son in uh, 2022 and I went on maternity leave. I came back and I think I was really trying to push, you know, prove myself and make sure everyone knew I was back. You know, none of my skills had slipped, <laughs> which, uh, you're just, you're just worried about it. And my boss, you know, my manager now, Carissa, she was like, Jordan, it's okay. You know, you are, everything is good. You are performing. Things are thriving. You would know if you weren't right. And I think that she really helped me understand and focus on prioritization, but not while sacrificing your well-being. So you're not going to bed thinking about, oh, I could have done this. I should do this. What I have to do tomorrow, having that separation. And I would love to say that she gave me, you know, five tips that I just follow and check off. Um, but it really isn't that simple. I think it's more of your mindset 
and your ability to work. And it's always a work in progress. It's not something that shifted overnight and I still work on it. But I think that she's a really great leader in the terms of helping you constantly realize, you know, I, I, I heard this somewhere, so I can't take credit for it, but we're not saving lives. We're saving PDFs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I like that. You know, again, I stole that from somewhere. So don't, it's not a Jordan original, but, uh, you know, and it's true. I think, you know, it's true. Everything you're doing is important and you want to do the best you can and you want to succeed and you want to help your team and help your company. But you also have to think about yourself and you're your own advocate when it comes to that. So that that's really helped put it in perspective since I've been back from leave for sure. No, that's great. Uh I think the challenge in terms of marketing, especially digital marketing or marketing at scale is like we don't see our customers as people as much, right? Their names at a database, their cookies that are visiting our site, their email addresses, you know, whatever. And so like, that's a great lesson. Like, but yes, we can see each other. We're working together as humans and we treat each other that way. And sometimes we have a harder time with customers, right? So I wonder, do you have any example with your customers, how you're able to balance ambition with well-being, right? Our ambition would be getting that conversion goal, you know, getting a sale, a lead, whatever it is, with the well-being of like what's best for them. Um, so for example, I wrote a case study um, on Visible, which is a cell phone service owned by Verizon. We're talking about COVID. During COVID, they launched a campaign called hashtag visible acts of kindness. And what they did was they just they gave their marketing budget away or part of it. They had a $250,000 budget and they helped a thousand people. <laughs> you know, they, the people who use that hashtag. They gave $250 gift card to a thousand people who just needed help with something, who mentioned it on their social media platform. And the CMO told me, I know we are all trying to sell something, but at the end of the day, if you can prove that you have the right to be in that person's world, that will go above and beyond your product, your brand, and your company. So Jordan, I wonder for you, I think that's like, there's a great story from you personally, you know, with your coworkers balancing ambition and, and, and well-being. Have you ever been able to do that with your customers? Do you have any examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really big part of just everything that I've done through my personal career. And then also I've been lucky enough to work for different companies that always have that in mind, meaning, you know, their well-being of their customers. Um, and, you know, every place I've been, they want people to be a customer if that's right. Right. It's not it's not an if or and if the while I say if, but <laughs> when it is right for them, right, that's when that company is there. So um, just trying to think back to a particular time, I worked for a pretty small uh, like shop, I would say early on in my career, uh, more of like an agency side of things. And we were lucky enough to be a woman owned business. And so we would go to a lot of events that were specifically for women owned businesses, right? Small businesses, that sort of thing. And there was an instance where we really collaborated with other women owned businesses and we would get together almost for networking events, but it was really more of social gatherings. And it was a place to, you know, collaborate, talk, catch up on our personal lives with each other. And I feel like that was a sense of, I don't know if giving back is the right term, but I think it was a sense of kind of like serving your community, if that makes sense. It was um, more of, hey, we're all in this together and we could all actually be each other's clients in real life because we were all in different industries. But our commonality was the woman owned business aspect. And it was just on a personal level, right, balancing that okay, maybe you could be a customer, maybe you could be working, but right now we're going to focus on this camaraderie we have and this connection we have and do a little like social interaction, right? And be human with each other. And I felt that that was really powerful. Yeah, seeing people as people, not as just leads, right? Yeah, not just opportunities exactly. or whatever. Um, you say, take someone under your wing and you learned this from Rob Ganjon. And so I'm guessing, did Rob take you uh, under his wing? And then how did that go? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so um, uh, last name is Ganyan. So he, Ganyan. Would, he would be like, Jordan, why didn't you tell him? So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for um, correcting me. No problem. So um, yeah, I was lucky enough to meet Rob, I think at this point, maybe six years ago, I would say. Um, he was our former president of Sela. And he, he really saw, I, I think, 
potential in me. And I was really grateful for that. Um, I, for my first son, I came back from maternity leave and him and my former boss at the time, you know, they were talking about some of the aspects of my job that I was performing well. And I met with him and he talked about, you know, these opportunities on the marketing team and how we could think I could make a difference. And that doesn't happen for a lot of people. You know, I feel really lucky that he took the time. He saw the potential. He had the conversation with me. He believed in me. Um, you know, I always think it comes from somewhere. So clearly I had to be doing something right to even start that conversation. So I do give credit to myself where credit's due. But I think in life, sometimes you need that person. You need someone around to believe in you, to see your potential, right? And to just say your name in a conversation. And that really starts everything. It kickstarts it. And he believed in me to join this marketing team, you know, when we were very small. And then when we had years of change, whether that be the rebrand, whether that be the acquisition, we had a period of time where we were looking for a VP when our former VP left. And he really entrusted me with leading the team and keeping everything going. Um, and I just think that he made it feel like I didn't have imposter syndrome. <laughs> so uh, having his confidence and his backing, I thought, well, I have to be doing something right, you know, or they wouldn't have entrusted me with these things. So I just think, you know, if you're lucky enough to find that person, that's that's really great. And I've had that experience, which is wonderful. Well, let's look in the other direction now. You're a little farther along in your career. Can you give us an example of how you mentor someone, how you've mentored someone in your career? Because for example, you know, when you're talking about a story, it reminded me of the last blog post. And it was about 10 or 15 years ago, it was this kind of group blog posting idea I got from the last lecture, which if people don't know the last lecture, it's a, it was a professor who was dying of cancer, some sort of science. But he, used, he said, hey, if I had one last lecture to give in life, it wouldn't necessarily be about whatever science he taught. It'd be like, here's the things I learned in life. So I had the idea of like to a bunch of bloggers, we did a group network of bloggers, Guy Kawasaki and others, and we said, hey, if you could write one final blog post, what would it be? And I even myself didn't know what I would write at that time. But what I ended up writing about was a lot of the people I worked with and learned from. <laughs> and it was, I mean, that was mostly what my career was. Oh, these people, I learned from them. Here's what I learned from them. I'm so thankful. Which, if it sounds familiar, that became then when I launched How I Made It Marketing, this whole section was, okay, these are like the people I've learned from in my career. Um, so for you, Jordan, can you think of an example? Okay, you had that great experience with Rob. He took you under his wing. How have you mentored someone? Like, how do you mentor? What, how do you take someone under your wing? What have you learned to do there? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I don't know if it comes across, but I'm kind of an intense person. And <laughs> <laughs> by that, I mean, I, I tend to speak my mind. I, you know, wear my thoughts on my expressions and, you know, good or bad of it. That's kind of the way it is. So I always feel like, and I've had this feedback before that I, um, you know, I, ride hard for the people that report to me, the people that work with me. You know, if someone has something negative to say, or we're, we're dealing with a, you know, a tumultuous situation, which is rare, but it happens. Um, you know, I come to bat more so for those people than even myself. I'm like, you, you can say whatever about me and have your issues. That's fine. It, then when you're not the other, but when it comes to my team and my people, like that's where I get very passionate. Um, so could be good or bad. I don't know. But uh, I think in terms of mentoring, that shows through as well. You know, I would like to think, and I hope she would agree, but one of my direct reports right now, Jackie, she's our events marketing manager, and she's just amazing. And what I've always tried to do with her is give her real life experiences that I have gone through to almost say like, don't do what I did. Here's my advice, you know? And I always want people to learn for themselves and think for themselves and grow. But also I want to, I want to tell you what I've experienced. So hopefully if it was negative, you don't have to go through that. And I really, in terms of mentoring her, I give her that advice. I, I listen to her, which I think is a really big job of a mentor, right? Is to not just speak, but also listen because it's a two-way relationship. I learn things from Jackie every day, which I hope she learns from me as well. Um, and again, believing in her and putting her up, um, you know, in front of people as a success. So whether that's she doesn't really get FaceTime with 
certain executives, right? I'll always talk about her successes, things that she's doing well at, um, or if there's an opportunity you know, for her to be showcased in any sort of company communication, things like that. And I just really, I try to make sure that I have an impact on her so that one day if she's talking to someone the same way I'm talking to you, she would say like, yeah, my boss, Jordan, you know, I just think that that out of everything in my career, if I could have someone say that about me in an aspect, I think that that shows that I've succeeded in one way or another. That's awesome. And in fairness, you're saying that about previous bosses. You had to mean those are the conversations we're having right now. So hopefully we'll have, <laughs> you know, Jordan on how I made it marketing in 15 years. I'm sorry, uh, Jackie, was it on, on how yes. I made it marketing 15 years? She'll be like, Jordan Welby, here's what I learned from her. So um, <laughs> all right, you say the true essence of being a marketer is the ability to inspire, empathize and ignite a spark. And as I mentioned, you learned this from one of your former bosses, Kristen Valentine. So how did you learn this from Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give it all away because then everyone would know. But, uh, (laughs) uh, you know, I throughout my career, I had had really different instances in marketing. Like I was saying before, smaller teams, larger teams, smaller companies, larger companies. There were a lot of differentiators between everything. And I almost feel like I learned a lot boots on the ground, not necessarily through a class early on. And when I met Kristen, she she was a teacher. I think sometimes you have managers in life that really aren't teachers, right? And they're more of just do this because do this. And with Kristen, it was, I think we should do this because X, Y, and Z. And she taught. And I think Kristen was only my manager, honestly, for a year and a half. But She taught, she taught me everything. I don't even know how to condense it. I feel like, you know, she taught us, you know, what's the best way to, to, to track something? What's the best way to utilize our technology? What, what's the best way to survey your audience? Right. And she was all about empowering her people to do things and having that knowledge behind it so that we knew what we were talking about. We knew what we were doing and we knew why we were doing it. And I think she really set us all up for success to be able to continue, you know, past when she's there and then in our future, in our, in our future companies as well. I mean, she, she helped taught us how to craft our campaigns. Um, She really also talked about how marketing wasn't just about selling a service or a product, right? But it was about creating those connections about having those narratives, leaving a lasting impact. And she really tried to hone in on the idea of like, we're not just selling here. We're not just marketing here. We're making those longstanding relationships. And that was one of the biggest lessons I've learned for sure. Okay. So you talk about marketers, their job is to make those longstanding relationships. So this question, I think really gets directly into your industry, right? So if how do you find those people? How do you find these marketers who can build relationships, who can inspire, who can empathize, who can ignite, right? I mean, that's part of our role as marketing leaders, as marketers, to find the right people for our team. Uh, for example, when I interviewed Tom Amate, the co-founder and chief executive officer of Entail on how I made it in marketing, one of his lessons was prioritize talent over experience when recruiting. And he walked me through and us through the interviewing and testing processes he uses to find those people, right? He's not just looking at the resume that have got these certain certifications, right? He's looking for that certain talent. So for Jordan, for you, how, how do we find those people? How, how have you found people who are the true essence of a marketer? Mm-hmm. I think it's hard, you know, to be very honest. I think, um, There's only so much you can learn about someone from an interview, even if you have two interviews with them, three interviews with them, right? There's only so many telling signs that you can, you can see in someone, oh, they're going to be a great fit, you know? And over the years, we've had people who we thought were going to be great and weren't. And we've had the opposite of people we were lukewarm on, but they ended up to be fabulous. Um, So sometimes it is a crapshoot, honestly. But I think what you really have to look for, and this is going to sound kind of silly, but can you have that conversation with someone? Is it easy? Is it flowing? Like, yes, we need our technical skills from someone, right? But I think that we should value the soft skills 
if not equal, maybe even a little bit more than those technical skills. Because I do think in certain aspects of marketing, you can you can teach those technical skills, right? You can train on the technology, you can work through how to use it. But if someone doesn't have those soft skills to start out, and by that, I mean like their communication, their problem solving, their adaptability, like it's very difficult to teach those down the road. Um, and I really try to look for that. I try to look for, can I have a conversation with this person? Is this flowing easily? Do I feel like tomorrow if they join the team, it would be like they've been here for forever. And, you know, if you balance that with someone having the experience and the technical knowledge, right, that's your, your prize right there. Um, you might not always get that, but I really look for that communication, that connection, and do I think that this person is going to seamlessly integrate into this team, into this company and help us succeed? Because, you know, you have to spend, you have to spend so much time working with people when you work and you want to make sure you work with people you enjoy that are all here for the common goal, that are all good people. And if you can find that and you try to look for that and those aspects I was saying, I mean, I think that's the best you can do. All right, you mentioned those soft skills. Uh, well, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's so many. I'm like, well, which ones do I start with, right? Um, so I think some of the key qualities I would say is I really think someone who's staying current on trends, um, updating themselves, continuously learning, right? I think someone who kind of partners that ambition with the, the skills to continually learn, I think that's really essential for sure. Um, I think I would say someone who has had some practical experience, and I know that that's difficult when you're first starting out. Um, you know, sometimes this is your first job, this is your first internship, and it's difficult. But I would say someone who's had that practical experience with that, like some hands on experience, it's just kind of invaluable into your career. And I really think someone with adaptability and creativity, I think, is you need that. Um, because as much as we like to plan, and myself, I'm an over planner, <laughs> and especially in operations, you also have to be adaptable. You have to be flexible because in this industry, things are changing every day, right? The technology is changing, the market is changing, and you can't control that. So you have to be able to work with the things you can't control. Great. Well, for anyone looking to stay current, I hope everyone listening signs up for their <laughs> free three-month scholarship to the AI Guild. It's a great way to stay current. Uh, but seriously, Jordan, thank you so much for your time. I learned a lot from you today, and I think our audience did well. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it and I, I appreciate the time. Absolutely. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com. Thank you.